told you guys this, but did I tell you about the time I almost killed a guy with my preaching? No? Yeah, it's not what you think. It wasn't like I preached so hard, some guy's heart exploded. No, it was the opposite. Uh, we were, I, that would have been really cool. Not, not that he died, but the, you know, I could preach like that. But uh, we were at this camp. We were at this camp, you guys, and, the, and it was like 98 degrees. And in Southern California, 98 degrees is like a million degrees, you know? And I gave this sermon uh, about going out and finding God in nature and experiencing God in his creation. And it was an okay sermon, you know? But at the end, I said, you know what, you guys? Why don't you get out in God's creation and go experience what he's made for you? And I told him about this hike I did that was like the super, you know, ex like ex hard on your body, sweaty, hard, nasty hike to the top of a mountain. But I said the view was really good. And I said, you guys should all make it to the top of that mountain and see what God's made for you. What I didn't think about at the time is, y'all, there's some older people at church. Can I get an amen from some older folks, right? And, and I got done, and I walked towards my trailer, and I'm thinking, I really hope that they know they need to be in shape to do this hike. You know what I mean? And, and so I started praying. I was like, God, if there's somebody that on that hike that shouldn't be there, um, maybe stop them from going, you know, or just protect them. Like, give them a hedge of protection. And I went in my trailer, and I didn't think any more about it. Nobody told me a word until two months later. But I guess this older gentleman went on the hike, had a heat stroke, and started hallucinating on top of the mountain. You know, I guess he was up on top of the mountain singing about Barney the Dinosaur. Like, they were like, this guy is not okay, you know. Um, and, and luckily for me, the Lord answered my prayer, and one of the burliest, manliest men at our camp rode his bike to the top of the mountain and stuck this guy on it and pedaled him down to the bottom of the hill where he was uh, received some emergency care. And thank the Lord Jesus, he is still alive, you know? Because uh, that would have been a really bad way to start your ministry, killing some dude, right? But it, it ended up well. The Lord answered my prayer. For some reason, since I've been a believer, man, that God has come through in so many amazing ways for the law of him. In, in more ways than I could probably count. But this is our question for today. Does the Lord answer the prayer of believers? Does God answer the prayer of believers? Now, some of you just amen, but wait until I get halfway through the sermon. And we'll see if you're still amen, right? But I want to hop into the Lord's word. And I thought, you know, your guys' legs aren't tired. Let's stand up and let's, let's read the, the word together. We're going to be in Luke 11. Luke 11, 1 through 15. You guys, this parable, if you don't want to stand up, please stay down. It's fine. But if you would stand up, we're going to be in Luke 11, 1 through 15. This parable is called The Friend at Midnight. And before this, there's a prayer you guys are probably going to recognize. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us how to pray, as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who has sinned against us, and lead us not into temptation. Verse 5, And he said to them, Which one of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he answered from within, Do not bother me. The door is shut. And my children are in bed with me. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is a friend, yet because of his, I believe it's pronounced impotence or impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. You guys know this one. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. The one knocks. It'll be open. Isn't that beautiful? Amen. And the father among you, what father among you, if the son asks for fish, will instead give him a servant, or if he, uh, serpent, or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask of him? And this is the word of the Lord, people. The words written in red, the words of Jesus himself, and all of God's people said... Yeah. All right, take a seat, you guys. Thank you so much for bearing with me. You guys are going to be tired after today. I won't make you stand up again, okay? But uh, we all recognize this portion of Scripture, you guys. Uh, the beginning of this is perhaps one of the most memorized portions of Scripture in Christian literature. We actually probably recognize it more from its like companion passage in Matthew 6, you guys. But just so you know, this... This occurrence and what happens in Matthew 6 are actually two different occurrences in which the Lord gives this roadmap on how to pray 
to a holy God. And I, I don't know about you. Can I get a raise of hands? Who in here grew up Catholic? Where are my Catholic homies at? Okay, no, not a lot of you. <laughs> I forgot we're in a Baptist church. This is awkward. Okay, so I grew up Catholic. And growing up in a Catholic home, your grandma drags you to church, and she makes you do this thing called your first communion. Um, and in communion class, they drill this prayer in your head, but you have to remember it in the King James Version because that's the Holy Bible, right? And if you know this, uh, our Father's prayer in, in, in the King James, will you please recite it with me? It goes like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. Is we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever and ever. Amen. All right. Um, so when you're a Catholic child, that is drilled into your dome, right? I had that memorized at like eight years old. And here's the funny thing, you guys. I knew every word. But I knew nothing of the man behind those words, amen? I knew every single word of that prayer, but I didn't know the God I was talking to. You guys, it was drilled into my head. I, I knew the name of Jesus, but I didn't know the man of Jesus, amen? I didn't know Jesus as Lord. And nonetheless, I, I recited these words for the rest of my life growing up. And I would say this prayer before bed many times in my life with no relationship with God. But I would say this prayer kind of like rubbing the magic, like rabbit foot of God. You know, if I pray this prayer, God's going to come through for me on my behalf. And who here went to confession? Anybody ever go to confession? Anybody? Just me and Gary. Okay. Um, and a new lady I just met today. You, you guys may not know this, but in Catholic Church, you go in this wooden box, and there's this priest on the other side of the veil, and you walk into that box, and you go, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned, and he goes, what are your sins, son? And I'm about eight years old, you know, and you always lie in confession, <laughs> you sin on top of sinning, right? And I'm like, you know, I pulled my sister's hair, and I disobeyed my mom, you know? What I didn't tell the priest is I'm cussing and fighting and spitting, you know? And, and here's what's the crazy part. They would go, okay. Based on your gross sin as an eight-year-old boy, okay, go say five Our Fathers and ten Hail Marys, right? And I remember leaving that box, and I would go over to a pew that had these fold-down kneeling pads, and I would kneel, and I would say, I would say that prayer five times, and I would say ten Hail Marys, right? Because you pray to Mary. No, you don't. Okay, so and and I would pray those prayers, and I would rub that magic rabbit foot and go, okay, God, now through the power of that priest in that box and the power of my repetitive prayer, I am forgiven. And I just remember being so confused, you guys. But I have to ask, church, do you need a priest to intercede for you on behalf of God? Do you need to pray to the Virgin Mary? Is there any wall between us and the Lord? No. I didn't know that at the time. You know? So, we come to this prayer as as believers now, and you guys should know this is a wonderful, amazing, beautiful prayer laid out from Jesus. And you guys know Jesus prayed often and frequently in the Gospels. Jesus was always in prayer, always in communication with the Father. And the disciples are watching this, and they go, Jesus, teach us how to pray. John taught his disciples, please teach us. And we see this prayer. Jesus starts with these amazing points. I want you guys to hear this from me. Today he starts, Jesus started with, our Father. In, in his language, Jesus would have said, our Abba, our Dad. And I don't mean to be weird, but it actually means our Daddy, right? Please don't say Daddy God, that's weird, but that's what it is. It is the most intimate name any believer can use for an all-powerful and amazing God. And the Jews started almost every prayer they had with this, Abba, Father, hear our prayers. Abba, Father, intercede on my behalf. And notice the next words. What does he say next? Holy be your name, God. Your name is set apart. Your name is something special. The Jewish people had so much reverence for the Lord. You guys know they wouldn't even use his real name in public. right? They didn't want to say the real name of the Lord in public because it was so holy, so set apart. It couldn't come from a simple man's lips, right? And then we see your kingdom come, you guys. And this is amazing. It's the fact that we want to see the redemptive kingdom of God here on earth. And I hope some, there's some people in this room that want to see the redemptive 
kingdom of God enter our world. It means, y'all, we want to see some people saved. Amen? We want to see some people come to the Lord Jesus Christ. We want your kingdom here, God. And I want to emphasize this, not our own kingdom. And this is this amazing roadmap of how to pray for our needs. Next, you guys, we say, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. And then it ends with, help us to forgive others. Amen. But you guys should notice this. Every one of those things at the end of the prayer is already a promise we have from God. Did you guys notice that? Are, are we going to get bread tomorrow? Yes. As the birds get fed and the lilies of the fields are fed by the Lord, we are going to receive bread. Uh, forgive us our trespasses. I think that's already covered, amen? Jesus forgave us our trespasses. And help us to forgive others. We're called to that. And the last part is, is uh, dear Heavenly Father, please uh, keep us from temptation and deliver us from the evil one. People, what power does Satan have over a believer? None. Zero. Do we need to be delivered from the evil one? I got, I got news for you. If you're a believer, you've done been delivered. Amen? So we come to this beautiful prayer, and then we get to this strange parable at the end. And this is what I want to talk about today. I want to read these words to you at the beginning again. Which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, Do not bother me. The door is now shut, and my children are in bed with me, or are with me in bed, and I cannot get up and give you anything. Okay, so Jesus shares this crazy story of a man heading to his buddy's house at midnight asking for some bread. And there's some cultural things going on here. You guys should know that Jewish people within the Jewish culture were called in the Old Testament to be what? Hospitable, right? Jewish people were called to care for the person who is on a journey or who is traveling through their town. Actually, even if they didn't have much of a relationship with them, they were called to care for the traveler. So we see the situation and with the guys going to his neighbor who's called to bless him, and the guy going and asking for the bread needs to bless the man that's come in his home. And this is the situation we find ourselves in. But we must not lose sight of the idea of what time of the day is it right now. <coughs> it's midnight, y'all. It's the middle of the night. And I can tell you, we don't really recognize this because as Americans, we're not very friendly, are we? Right? I can tell you right now, I'm a pastor. I'm supposed to be nice. But if anybody in this building shows up to Zach Lawler's house at midnight, it's not going to be friendly. Okay? If I don't recognize you, all you're going to hear is my 12-gauge loading up some birdshot. Okay? If I recognize you, I'm probably just going to let the dogs out on you. All right? Do not come to my house in the middle of the night looking for some bread. I'm going to tell you that Walmart opens at 6 a.m., okay? But this, this is where we find these two men. But back in the day, you guys know, there was no supermarket, no Walmart to go to obtain some bread. And there's no way to know when somebody's going to show up on a journey. There's no GPS and an like, estimated time of arrival. And this guy's friend showed up unexpected, and he has no food. He has no way to be a good host. So he heads to a good friend's house, and he's like, man... Homie, I need some bread. And what does the guy respond with? Do not bother me. The door is shut, and my children are in bed with me. We can't overlook this little, this little point here, guys. Um, back in the day, you guys know they didn't have like a master suite with separate bedrooms. They didn't have beds for every individual of the family. You guys know for safety and warmth, they would do what was called like a sleep. Have you guys seen Crudes, the show Crudes, where they have a sleep pile? Anybody? Okay. Yes, that's what they're doing, all right? They're all in one room in a bed. And I just want to have a little side note. If you're married and your babies are in bed with you, stop it, okay? I'll buy you a bunk bed for your kids. That's not good for your marriage, okay? But back in the day, they would have the whole family sleep in one room in one sleeping arrangement. So here's what's going on. You need to know this friend is not just being rude and crude to his friend. If he gets some bread, he's waking up the entire household. You guys get this? You know what he's saying is, bro, get out of here. You're about to wake my wife up. Amen? And I don't need that. Can I get an amen from the fellows in the room? Okay? I can tell you right now, one of my biggest fears in life is waking my wife up in the middle of the night. Okay? She's gangster and terrifying. Okay? Like, right, I can, my boys can show up at any time of the night, 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning, and they like, Mommy, my tum tum hurts. And she'll jump up and go, oh, baby. Baby, are you okay? I could literally be having a heart attack, right? Like my heart could be exploding in my chest. If I can and I think I'm dying, why are you waking me up? Go die on the couch. I gotta go to work tomorrow. Thank you for the love and care, baby. So that's what's going on here. 
She might give me a time on my All right, so, so that's what's going on here, you guys. We have a guy going, brother, you're about to wake up my entire household. You are being so very rude right now. Your audacity to show up in here in the middle of the night is just unbelievable. And verse 8, Jesus goes on, I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is a friend, but because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. Do you guys know what this word means? The word impudence. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it. Ooh. Who said persistence? Okay. I love you, so don't get mad at me. Okay, but many people misinterpret this word to mean persistence, annoyance, right? But if you go back to the original words, it means shameless audacity. It means rudeness. It means crudeness. It means, yo, you showed up in the middle of the night and you have some shameless audacity to do so. Like, I can't believe you're doing this right now, right? Okay, so we come to the meaning of this parable. The, the Jewish people, as you know, had a great reverence for God, you guys. And I remember going up Catholic, if you guys or if you grew up a non-believer. Has any of you guys in this room ever kind of seen God as like this untouchable figure? Right? Like in the Jewish faith, you get that they had priests pray on their behalf. Or they had somebody intercede for them. In my Catholic faith, you needed to have a priest intercede for you. Or you went to the Virgin Mary to intercede for you because she was much kinder. And she could approach this mean guy up on the clouds. Is how I viewed, that's how I viewed God as a child. Okay, so in this parable, Jesus is saying, hey, look, like, Jesus, uh, my father is not going to be like this mean, crude guy up on a mountaintop that you can't approach in audacity and in prayer and in bluntness. You guys can approach the father at any time, any day, any week. You can approach your father with audacity, and he is going to live through with his character. What is Jesus saying? If your Jewish friend will get out of bed and give you and give you that bread because it's part of his character to do so, how much more can you count on the character of God to show up for his children when we need him? Amen? Jesus goes on. And this is where we get off in the weeds a little bit. And I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find not. And it will be open to you for everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks it will be open. What father among you, if his son asks for fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Okay, so I want to just slow down here a little bit, you guys. There's a lot of churches, and there's a lot of people that take this part of the parable in some really funny directions. Right? Some people have developed the idea that if I ask God as a believer... I'm going to get a yes, amen? If I knock on that door, he's going to give me what I want. And we come back to that question, will Jesus answer every prayer of a believer? Are you guys ready for the answer? Yes. But you may not like the answer. He's going to answer your prayer. But hear me, church, sometimes we don't like the answer we receive to that prayer. That's found in verses 11 and 13. Let me, let me just give you a little expansion on that. God's going to answer every prayer of a believer, but the answer might be no, amen? Sometimes God says no, that's not what is best for you. A little bit further, sometimes when you pray to God, he says what? Wait, hold up, wait on the Lord. That is the most annoying response to a prayer we can get, right? Because we're impatient. We don't want to wait on the Lord. We want to do it now. And sometimes the answer to a prayer might just be yes. But here's two promises I can make. Number one. God hears your prayers, amen? Number two, he's working on it. I heard a pastor say it like this. You guys know the Bible tells us that the Lord never sleeps, right? The Lord is always awake, always alert, always moving. So he says when he lays down in bed for prayer at night, he prays to God and he has this deep, comfortable slumber afterwards, right? He says when I'm sound asleep, I know that the God of the universe is still working hard, amen? I know by first thing in the morning, the Lord, the Lord is going to have it all worked out on my behalf, right? But here's what we fall into, you guys. Sometimes the Lord has it worked out by morning. We just don't like the way he worked it out. Sometimes we're not super comfortable with the answer we get. But here's the thing. Because God is a loving Father, he wants what's best for you, not what you think you need in the time. Because he's a loving Father, he gives you what, you, what is best for you, not because of what you think you need. 
And he says this, What father among you, if he asks for a fish, will instead give him a serpent? If he asks for an egg, will instead give him a scorpion? And these are this idea that we could just demand something from God, right? Like, God, if I ask for a fish, I expect a fish. God, if I ask for an egg, I'm getting some eggs. But here's the part you need to hear, people. Sometimes a serpent looks like a fish. And sometimes a scorpion looks like an egg. You guys are pastors tripping. I want you to hear me on this one. I'm going to just make fun of my son for a second because it's my favorite thing to do. All right? My older son, Tyler, he loves fast cars. Okay? He desperately wants a little car. We call it a car. We call it Dodge Hellcat. You guys know what I'm talking about? Okay? And he comes to me and mom. And he goes, mom and dad, if you love me, son, you know I love you. Right? If you love me, you're going to buy me a Dodge Hellcat. I got a job. I'll help pay for it. But here's the point, you guys. I'm a loving father most of the time. Okay? If I give a 17-year-old boy a car with 700 horsepower, I'm handing him a death trap. Amen? I might as well blindfold him and tell him to go play in traffic. You know? Like, that is not what a loving father would do. How about this? He's even smarter than that. He goes, okay, mom and dad, I get it. The car's too powerful. Um, you know what's cheaper? A street bike. Right? A street bike. You know what? A uh, street bike's cheaper. It gets good fuel economy. And, and I'm sitting there going, yeah, a super fast bike, an a immature child, and no helmet laws. What could possibly go wrong? Amen? As a good father, I give my son what he needs, not what he wants. Amen? I give my son what he needs, which is why I bought him a slow Dodge pickup truck. Can I get an amen? And I will tell you, you're never getting that car as long as I'm alive. I don't care if you're 45 and stabbing the tires, right? I'm not going to let it happen. I love you too much for that. But we come to this point of believers that I need to ask you. Sometimes we ask for things from God and he knows they're just not good for us. Is there any older people in the room that know this? That like sometimes you've asked for things in life and prayer and God didn't give them to you and you realize if you would have received those things it would have been terrible for you. Anybody in the room hear me on that one? Can I get a witness in that? Yeah. Yeah. A loving father gives children what they need, not what they want. As a matter of fact, can I ask you this? What if what you want is good for you, but it's bad for God's glory? What if what you want is great for you, but it's not going to bring glory to God? Would you still want it? Would you still want it? So I want to come to the second point. Will Jesus answer every prayer of a believer? Yes, but you may not like the answer. And number two, yes, he'll give you a yes to every prayer if you pray for God's will. If you pray for God's will to be done in your life. Notice something, you guys. Jesus gives us roadmap to prayer. And he says, in that roadmap to prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done. Then he comes to this parable and says, ask and you will receive. Is there a possibility that God's saying, if you ask for my will... If you ask for my Holy Spirit, y'all, I can guarantee you're going to get it. Amen? And we know that God's will is far greater than our own. And we know that nothing can stop God's will. I love Psalm 18, 30-31. It says this, This God, His ways are perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for those who take refuge in Him. For who is God but the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? Amen? His will is perfect. His will is awesome, and His will is what we should pursue in our lives. Pray for the will of God in your lives, church, not for your own. Pray for God to have His way in your life. Do not pray to have your way in life. And this brings us to our big idea. Prayer should be viewed as a search for God's will, not your own. Amen. Prayer should be viewed as a search for God's will in your life, not your own. You guys hear me on this, and I want you to hear you. Prayer is not designed to align God with what you want. Prayer is designed to align you with what God wants for your life. If God changed to fit your will, He's no longer God, amen? He's no longer all-powerful. If God changes to fit your will, you become God. And you guys, right now, we live in this manifest destiny culture. Right? We have a, we have a speak it, see it, claim it kind of generation. Sometimes in the church, you guys, if I believe it, if I see it, if I speak it, I'm going to get it. But that's not God, you guys. That's a magic genie. Right? It's our will. It's our plan. It's our desire. But what I want you to know, church, today is that you should pray for the will of the Father in everything you do. Because it's what's best for you. And it's because God loves you. Amen? But I come to this point. You know, it's
it's easy to come up here as a pastor and say to pray for God's will when God's will feels good all the time. But has anybody ever had a point in life where they're praying for God's will on something and the answer doesn't feel good? Have you ever had a time in life where you're praying for someone you love who doesn't believe? And you're like, God, if your will could just be done in their life, receive a no time and time and time again. And let's just say hypothetically, you know, you're a pastor and, and you have this father who's been drinking for so long as the organs are starting to shut down. And you lay down in bed every night and you say, God, if it would be your will, God, save my death. If it would be your will, God, do something. Move. You have to save him. God, I don't want to get to heaven and not see my dad there. God, you got to move. And every morning you wake up and the answer still seems to be no. Amen. And sometimes it's easy to pray for God's will, but you got to ask God, what if I pray for your will and it hurts me? What if I pray for your will and it's not easy to take? What if I pray for your will and it's not what I want to receive at that point? But I come to this point... In the Bible, you guys, do you remember when Jesus was in the garden? The garden he created. And Jesus is on his knees, and Jesus is sweating blood, and he's, and he's talking to God, and he says, Lord, Lord, if it is your will, take this cup of suffering from me. And how does he finish? He says, Lord, your will be done, not my own. Your will be done, not my own. And we have to realize there's this point where God is in the garden, the living, breathing appearance of the Lord on this earth. And he's on his knees and he's praying, God, take this cup. Because what does Jesus know is coming? Jesus knows every blow, every abuse, every spit in his face, every whip. He knows that cross is coming his way. But he's such an amazing, loving God. He says, your will, Father, not my own. Your will in my life, God, I want to live out what you've called me to. Let's never act like our God doesn't know the consequences and the suffering and the pain of living out the will of the Father. Amen? So I look at the people in this room. And I look at my dad if he's watching. And I say, Dad, when are you going to get to a point or you've been chasing the world long enough before you realize it's not going to work out. People, when are we going to get to a point in our lives when we realize chasing our own will isn't what we need, but the will of the Father is what He desires for us? When are we going to get to a point where we realize that our Father suffered, our Father bowed to the will of, um, our, our Jesus bowed to the will of the Father, and that He gave it all, knowing that it was worth it for God to receive His plan and have His plan worked out. And I look at some of you and I go, maybe it's time to let go of your will, isn't it? God, maybe it's your time to realize that I love my dad very much. And I don't want to see him living for himself anymore. God, if you could just bring him to your side. Man. If you could just move something in his heart. God, may it be your will that he would know you your will that he would come to you and be your child. Maybe your will that he would get over this addiction. God, maybe your will that he would save him. And that's my prayer for every person in this room. If you don't believe that you would know he was good, if you don't believe you know he was God, if you don't believe you know he's the one who's